Greetings, my name is Vincent, and in this exciting episode, we're going to be taking an in-depth look and doing a bit of an update on a game that is a quarter of a century old, and it's very obscure, but it's a wonderful little hidden gem. A game that apparently was the result of an in-house competition at Games Workshop for the game designers to create a quick rough and ready game, and Andy Chambers' Bombers Over to Sulphur River was the winner of this competition. Now. Because this game is 25 years old, I thought we could just do a few little updates and tweaks here and there to the original game system and make something quite special. For example, I'm going to be doing my first ever 3D printing on this episode, and I'm going to be doing my first ever bit of woodworking on this episode, where we'll be doing things like taking the original board game board bits, as you see here, and turning them into something that looks a little bit more like this here a bunker sex <laughs> In this adorable little game, you can either play as the attacking orcs with your four fighter bombers trying to blow up very important strategic imperial targets, or you can play as the imperial defenders of said targets. As you can see, the rules are very lightweight, it's only a couple of pages here, and it's a very quick game to get through. Games Workshop actually released this game as a PDF in 2005, so you might be able to find the files online. Well, that's all the cardboard stuff out of the way, let's move on to the exciting part, which is, of course, the metal miniatures. The game comes with two Imperial Thunderbolts, and four Orc Fighter Bombers. The first upgrade I decided to do to the original board game was to replace the tokens with some actual 3D printed files that you can see here. If you don't have access to a 3D printer, you can just use the Manticore tanks for the flat cannons, and improvise with the laser turrets. And alternatively, the rock spires could be made of plaster or foam. Now, if you're familiar with Games Workshop flying models, they always come with little flying bases. Now, the only problem is this box that I've made for the game has walls that sit quite high. So I wanted the flyers to be as high, if not higher than the walls, so you're not having to fiddle around too much within the box. So we'll be making some custom bases next. These 2mm steel rods will be the replacement stems for these clear plastic bases, and these are the flat cannon and laser turret bases. I snapped off the clear plastic stems, but I left the base of the stem in the actual base itself, but drilled an exact size that's required for the new steel replacement, as you can see here. And then I just added some super glue to hold everything in place. Then I use the same super glue as my adhesive for adding the texture to all of the bases, from the flying bases to the artillery bases. Then it was just a matter of gluing the 3D parts to the black bases. Once all of the 3D parts were dry on their bases, I added the additional glue for the gravel that would be surrounding them. I'll now do a quick cleanup and assembly of all the models as this was a second-hand set that needed a little bit of TLC. I wanted to make the holes on the exhaust and intakes of the jets a little larger, just so they had a bit more depth and realism to them. I then removed any excess flashing or old super glue as you can see here, just so I had a clean slate to start from. I scored the pieces of metal where the super glue was going to be bonded together, just to create even more adhesion. I then glued back together the wing section and fuselage section of all the flyers. Now I'm using my gel based glue here, it's Gorilla Glue, I love this stuff, it's really good for metal miniatures like this as well. Let's finally get to painting the flyers, starting with priming all of the models, of course. I primed in black, but you can use whichever colour you like and most comfortable with to prime in. 
I do recommend priming the model and the base only and not the rods for the flyers because that's going to be your handle throughout the painting process and you can paint it at the end. Once the priming was finished, I decided to first paint up all of the Imperial Thunderbolts. Due to this being in a desert of some sort, I decided to paint up all the Imperial Flyers and artillery in a desert theme. The majority of this will be handled by our next step, the base coat. Good thing is it's only two planes, so this step didn't take very long at all. Just make sure it's completely dry before you move on to the next step. I then worked on picking out any parts I wanted to have as a raw metallic finish. Now I'm using a Vallejo metal colour specific paint. This isn't their model colour or game range, but it comes in a larger bottle and it really is fantastic stuff. It completely rolls off the paintbrush really nicely. It's not sticky like a lot of metallic paints can be. As I always say, just make sure that you wash your metallics in a separate pot to your regular paints. I then put a soft brown wash over the base coat and metallic silver to bring a little uniformity to the model while also adding shade to the recesses. One thing I have found with this particular tan coloured Vallejo paint is it does reactivate very easily when you add a wash over the top. To avoid this issue, just add varnish before you add the wash. To further accentuate the recesses, I went in with some Rhinoxide. Now this is a step you can avoid or just skip entirely because we have of course just added the wash. But the one thing I find when it comes to epic scale is the more contrasts you add, the better the model looks the cleaner it looks too. So that's why I'm going ahead with this Rhinox layer. To create a bit more depth to the shading, I added a glazing layer of a slightly darker brown over the body panels in areas where appropriate. This is a really subtle step. You don't have to do this either, but I just wanted to add a little bit more richness over the large panels of the plane, just to give it a bit more movement and a bit more realism. And the way in which I'm painting this is a technique called glazing. Once the shading on the Thunderbolts were complete, I decided to move on to the highlighting process next. I used a size 1 brush, and most importantly I used the side of it, because we're doing edge highlighting. Now I could have actually done some glazing and really brightened up some areas rather than just doing edge highlighting, but I didn't really feel the need to go much brighter on the body panels, so I just did the edge highlighting with a size 1 brush, picked out some points where I feel the light would have been the brightest on the model, and then moved on. I didn't want the models to be particularly too deserty, so I decided to add one additional colour to the desert theme, so the colour I went with was a yellow, because I'm pretty confident in painting some nice yellows, and this was just to give the Imperial Flyers that little bit of extra visual interest while on the game board. This is a technique I do a lot, which is just my Avalan Sunset Cassandora yellow and then some brighter yellows after that. I quite like the process, I'm pretty confident, and I did a video of me painting a rhino in a pretty similar fashion. The only difference is just a few less steps. As you can see, it holds everything together quite nicely and it isn't feeling too out of place with the rest of the tan paint job on the plane. Once I was finished with my highlight, I just did a couple of dots of Dawn Yellow just to add to the vibrancy and also to fall in line with the brightest points on the tan sections of the plane too. I then moved on to painting the cockpit glass. You won't see me painting the glass again with the Orc Flyers because it's the exact same paint process as what we're going to go through here. Take your time with this step and don't be frustrated if you make mistakes. I always find painting glass to be one of the hardest things to do at this stage in my painting career. I don't enjoy doing it because obviously it's a kind of illusion that you're attempting to pull off a little bit like non-metallic metal. You're trying to make something appear like glass. It's a little bit different from painting body armor. So as you can see here, we're just moving up into a pretty bright tone that's a big departure from the previous two paints that we've put down. And that's just because I'm sketching. I want to find where the brightest points would be sitting on the glass and hopefully blend smoothly up into those with some darker tones that match the previous colors that we first laid down. As you can see here, I'm pulling some paint around, making sure that the brightest points are reaching the top of the glass, as you can see here, and then finishing off with some pure white paint in a few select places, just to really try and sell that illusion of what glass is, which is, of course, highly reflective. <laughs> 
just to really sell the point, the only place on the entire model that has pure white paint is the cockpit glass because I want that to be the focal point and really sell the idea that that would be naturally the brightest point on the plane. Finally, this thin black line is a dividing point between the blue glass and the metallic silver that will be going around the cockpit shell shortly. Once this silver is finished, that little black line will really make things look clean. And talking of things looking clean, you may notice that there are a couple of painting mistakes around the cockpit glass. Those were cleaned up off camera. The missiles were up next and were a pretty simple step due to mostly having an off-white appearance. Now Orthwin Grey takes a couple of coats, make sure that you keep things nice and flat. My particular pot of paint was coming out very sticky for some reason, which is very annoying because obviously with Epic Scale you really don't want any texture in the paint because that can be pretty noticeable. We got there just doing it with some thin coats. And then once I was happy with the coverage of the Orthwin Grey, I moved into doing the missile tips a bright red. Now, with my reds, I generally do a flat Games Workshop red of some kind, and then follow up with this Vallejo transparent red, which I absolutely love. And as you can see, the difference that it makes is quite substantial. Gives it a real depth. Now, I must apologize, I'm using Gulliman Blue glaze paint, which doesn't exist anymore, sadly. But you can pretty much mix up a watered-down blue of any kind, and do a similar job as you're seeing here. Finally, a silver highlight was added where necessary to make these Thunderbolts complete. Now, because these are the Imperial Guard or Astra Militarum, of course they're very regal and very proud, so I made sure that the silver parts on this were nice and shiny, but we do avoid this step on the Orcs just to keep things nice and dirty. Let's move on to the Orc Flyers, where I decided to paint them as two different clans because I didn't give myself enough work for this episode. And these clans are, of course, going to be the Bad Moons and the Evil Suns. Why? I don't know. I just quite like the yellow and the red offsetting each other on the game board. Let's start with the Bad Moons and their iconic yellow paint job, though. I'm starting with Avalan Sunset as my base coat, throwing this through the airbrush, but you can obviously do this with a regular paintbrush too. I'm now going to add a very generous amount of Cassandora Yellow as the shade that's going to be going over the top here. Do like the orange tone. You can go with a brown tone like an Agrax Earth shade or something like that too, but I wanted to keep it nice and colorful. Once the base coat and shading was dry, I then moved on to the black markings. You don't have to start the black markings at this stage. You can do them at any stage you want. I just didn't want to have too much of the yellow paint job done, causing me more problems down the road that I may need to potentially fix with fixing highlights and shading rather than just only having to fix shading potentially if the black markings didn't work out too well. Hopefully that makes sense. But you can choose at which point you start the black marking process for yourself. Definitely want to use a size zero brush for this and just make sure the paint is really rolling off the brush nice and easy, especially when you're trying to do this in one fell swoop, a nice swirly movement to imply its flame-like qualities. You don't want the brush having no paint on it halfway through that movement, then having to try and continue that movement again with new paint on the brush. It's just much easier if you can get it done in one go. Obviously you're going to be able to layer things up and you can always add yellow paint back around edges too just to fix the shaping of things, but it's much better if you can get it done first time correctly. This is a good example of a nice confidence stroke that I'm talking about, just making sure that you've got the shape moving and flowing correctly and then doing something a little bit different above it or next to it because you don't want things to look too repetitive. It doesn't matter if they look similar, but if you can add a little bit of variation in, it's going to really help sell the theme. Now on to the very fun task of painting all of my highlights around my markings. Not too much to say on this, just make sure that you take your time and really just focus on pulling the highlights into the correct places where you'd want the brightest points to be, making sure that you don't put the bright paint in the shaded areas that you still want to keep shaded. As you can see, I'm generally speaking pulling up the paint towards the top of the aircraft like so, making sure that the brightest points are where, logically, the sun would most likely be catching the top surfaces of the planes. And I do this for all of the planes throughout the video. 
I was getting a little bit sick and tired of zooming my eyeballs into looking at little markings and little highlights, so I went back to a simpler step of just doing the metallics to give my eyes a little bit of a rest before I moved on to finally doing the finessing on the yellow highlights. Pull out any particular part you want to be silver. It doesn't really matter because it's an orc plane after all, so the more random the better. But I kept things pretty simple and conventional on these particular planes, just because I wanted things to look as smart as possible for the video. The copper and dark copper sections that you're seeing are repeated in the Evil Sun's paint job, so you'll only see the paint process for these at this stage. To keep the random orky vibes going, I did all the metallic sections in three different colours, from a steel to a brass and a very, very dark decayed copper. I think that just added to the random wackiness and the patchwork nature of these orc warplanes. The decayed metal was left as is, no shading or highlights were added because I just quite liked the way it looked on its own. I did want to emphasise the holes on the exhaust pipes here though, so I just used some Reichland Flesh Shade to bring them out a little bit, and give the brassy brass colour a bit more depth. And just in case you missed it, I did cover how to paint the cockpit glass in the Thunderbolt section of the video. With all the metallics out the way, I went back to the yellow again, this time adding a little bit of a brighter yellow highlight. This Flash Gits yellow highlight covered about a third less the previous real yellow layer, so I'm just focusing in on edges and high surfaces and areas that should naturally catch the light as you'd expect, making sure that I don't cover up too much of the previous layer that I've already put down. And that's how you get these kind of smooth transitions. What's so great is you're barely using any paint, but still getting very good results nonetheless. And at this point I'm doing a mixture of edge highlighting and glazing to get this result. Now I'm just adding a few pinpricks of the brightest yellow I want to see on this plane. It's also called flash in some cases. It's just a tiny prick of paint just to give that final pop of contrast. Just make sure the paint is a little bit thicker than you'd normally do on the previous layer because you do want it to not completely soak in. Well, that's how I like to do it anyway. As you can see, the paint is almost sort of sitting on top rather than soaking into the previous layer. I prefer that just to give it that extra shine. I then moved on with doing the black highlights. These black highlights are pretty simple. I'm not getting too bogged down in doing glazing or nice transitional highlights or anything like that. I'm pretty much just focusing my attention only on the edges of the black sections. I just feel the yellow is doing so much of the work, almost don't want to detract from it by doing a bunch of additional highlights with the blacks. So we're just going to be focusing our attention in on the edges and making sure that we keep everything neat and tidy as we go. The next highlight is the same as the previous, the only difference is we're focusing our attention more and more into corners rather than across broad edges. Now the bad moon planes are done, let's take on the evil sun flyers, starting with their red base coat. The next step was to make this red nice and dirty, so I smothered the flyers in Agrax Earthshade. Once the wash was dry, I blocked out all the areas I wanted to be black. Just as a quick aside, the black highlight process for the Evil Suns planes is the exact same process as the Bad Moons. I ended up going with scale colour black, but you can use Games Workshop black, just depends on how you want the finish to look, because something like GW has a shinier finish than that of scale colour, but if it's getting matte varnish, it doesn't matter either way. The metallic silver stages were next, I decided against adding the Agrax Earthshade, as I wanted these metallic parts to be much shinier. Now sometimes you still will want to add a wash to your metallics, but this particular Vallejo metal colour metallic does such a good job of building up and getting darker in the recesses naturally anyway. The rest of the model is quite dirty and dank looking as you can see here from the side, 
and I just wanted some vibrancy, so I chose the silver parts to be the really shiny part that stood out on the model. I decided to add a fun little detail with a spiral on the tip of the missiles to give the flies a bit more of a orky feel. The way in which I painted this was very similar to how I approached doing the pattern on Harlequins. Uh, if you can find a good tutorial video on how to paint Harlequin patterns, that should get you through this process too. Due to this being quite a tricky little pattern, obviously cleanup is to be expected, so that's what this stage is. Just going back in with the previous black layer and tidying up all those white edges where the white shouldn't be. Getting the red to stand out was the next step, so I moved forward and attempted to bring out the highlights in the reds. Doing these highlights was the exact same process as doing the highlights on the Bad Moon's planes. The only difference is I didn't have to worry about painting around Bad Moon's markings, which saved me a heck of a lot of time. So just make sure that you're pulling up the paints, the brighter you go, smaller areas that you're covering, and brightening areas that logically would be catching the most light. And just remember, these are glazing layers, so two of these layers in each area should do the job quite nicely before you move on to the next stage. The paint is rolling off very nicely on the brush. I don't want any sticky paint here for these processes because otherwise the transitions might start to look a bit fake or a bit rough. So we're going in nice and easy here with these wet layers. It's also easier to fix mistakes because you're not committing too much paint too quickly. And with that wet texture, it's much easier to pull the paint towards the final direction where you want it and having much smoother transitions because of that moisture on the brush. This is as bright as I was willing to go with the reds. I could have gone brighter with a fire dragon bright orange or something like that, but it was already starting to look quite cartoony. And I think that this is enough of a balance. Also, I have to consider the fact that the rest of the model in the darker areas is quite dark and greasy, and I didn't want to lose that energy either. If things start getting too bright, then it loses some of that edge that you get from the darker areas. All the original metal models that would have come with Bombers Over the Sulphur River are now finished enough to my liking. They were all varnished heavily due to them being metal models. You see, metal models have a habit of chipping very easily, especially when you put them on skinny, very tall custom bases, like I've done here. Now, something brand new to my channel is the inclusion of my 3D resin printer. It's amazing for projects like this where you can find pretty much anything online on a whim and scale it down to include in the epic scale. So let's paint up the rock column to take the place of the token that came with the game. Now, I know a lot of people in the epic community love 3D printing, and I don't blame you. It is a heck of a lot of fun. This was printed on a Anycubic Photon M3, which is the resin printer that I own, and it did an absolutely fabulous job. I am thoroughly enjoying the resin printing process because I can make things like this in about 10 hours. I did four of these in one go. I made sure that it was sitting on a 45 degree angle, so I wasn't putting too much pressure on my bed, and these came out beautifully. I will have links in the descriptions to the printable files that I've used here, I do recommend scaling them down to 35% for the cliffs and 28% for the gun platforms. Those were the percentages that worked for me. And the slicing software I used was the free version of Cheeto Box. The columns were painted the exact same way as the cliffs that hug the sides of the custom game board that you will see later on. The flak and laser turrets that you can see here have been finished in the exact same paint scheme as the Thunderbolts. The only thing missing are the yellow sections. Everything else has been painted the same. Painting the base here is practically the same as doing the rock columns. The only difference is this wash is a lot darker. I didn't think having that dark of a wash on the rock columns would have looked particularly good. And the only other main difference is I didn't add the golden brown highlight at the very end on these rocks either. Now let's take a look at all the finished models, including the ones that were not included in the tutorials. 
Finally, let's take a look at the custom board that I made for Bombers over the Sulphur River. The game is based around three cardboard pieces, but I didn't want to use the original, so I scanned them and sent them to a print shop and had them printed on fresh pieces of card. I then measured out the sides of the box and how high I wanted these cliffs to be, bearing in mind the height of the planes and how big my rock moulds were. I wanted to be able to paint the rock moulds in one go, outside of the box and glue them straight in, so I attached them to this plastic sheet first, painted everything up, glued everything together, and then I could just glue it straight into the box with as little fuss as possible. I'm now cutting up all the little pieces that were required to make up the box. I also included a little slot at one end so I could slide everything in and take it out, just in case there are any measurement issues along the way. Once I had all my MDF pieces, I glued them together. One crucial thing is, I did actually make a sheet of clear plastic cut to the same width as the box too, which was protecting the game board pieces. Now I did cut in half a lot of the rock moulds because they were too high, but that was great because it added a bit more randomness to the entire process. I also glued in a little stones and rocks here, just for additional texture, then I primed everything in automotive primer, and then did the paint process that you've already seen on the rock columns. I then painted the backing strips of plastic that were holding the cliffs together in black because the interior of the box was going to be black and then I glued them in and left it to dry overnight. I then painted the exterior of the box and finally eight brass corner brackets were added to give it a bit more of a tough look and also to protect the corners. In conclusion, this box set was an absolute blast to flesh out from its original presentation. This will most likely be one of the first GW games I introduced to my two boys when they're a little bit older. There are already a couple of great videos that cover the gameplay and mechanics well enough, so I won't walk on a path that's already well trodden. But instead, I think I've used this opportunity to show what can be done with some old and new tricks, from simple woodworking to 3D resin printing. Something that would have seemed like science fiction to 12 year old me in 1998 when this lovely little game was first released. Thank you very much for watching.